very good evening to all of you welcome to today's webinar today's webinar is titled career insights investor relations and is hosted by cfa institute and cfa society india i would like to take a moment to welcome our audience from around the world joining us remotely i am rajendra kalur cfa director cfa society india and will be the moderator for today's webinar before i introduce our speaker I have a couple of housekeeping notes. Today's webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes, including Q&A. 45 minutes for the presentation and the last 15 minutes will be devoted for Q&A session. We'll be leaving time for Q&A after the presentation. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. You can do so by clicking on the Q&A link at the bottom of your viewer and typing your question in the box. This webinar presentation will be available to view after the presentation concludes in the chat box. We value your feedback, so please complete the evaluation survey before you sign off today. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's webinar, Ornob Mondel. Ornob Mondel is the former head of investor relations at Larson & Tubro Limited. Mr. Mondel has spent 25 years with Larson & Tubro Limited and for the past 11 years, until his retirement in November 2020, he was the head of investor relations. He was also additionally responsible for spearheading leadership development and talent ma management within the finance function in LNT Group. Additionally, he was in charge of corporate accounts and corporate internal controls for the last six years. He handled the Apex Task Force on Integrated Report for Larson and Tubro for the last three years of his tenure. Mr. Mondel was ranked second among invest, investor relations professionals in Asia in 2019 by the esteemed Institutional Investor Magazine, the only Indian senior management professional to do so. Mr. Mondel, by qualification, is a chartered accountant. Over to you, Mr. Mondel. Delighted to have you. The screen is all yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Raj, and uh, uh, a very warm welcome to the audience. Uh, am I audible for everybody? Yeah, uh, Mr. Model, you uh, you yeah, can. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, I will straight away get into the presentation, and I'll, uh, I'll limit my uh, time to forty minutes. Uh, my first slide. Uh, actually, uh, I purposely put this slide uh, primarily to uh, depict a situation where IR cuts across all sectors. You here you'll see a number of sectors, whether it be engineering or FMCG, pharma, or whatever. And investor relations cuts across all sectors. And uh, I'll, I'll get into the details. Uh, uh, just I always make a, uh, uh, I, uh, typically in my presentations, which have forward looking statements, <coughs> I usually make a disclaimer, a disclaimer or a safe harbor statement because uh, not all uh, statements may, uh, future events may turn out to be materially different. Uh, I will take this uh, as read. Uh, now, a uh, very brief idea. Uh, Raj has already covered my uh, professional ex ex expertise, so I don't need to elaborate. Uh, needless to mention that uh, I have been doing around between 350 to 400 meetings every year with institutional brokerage houses for the last 11 years as part of my IR uh, function. It's, if it's okay, I'll just uh, turn off my video to conserve uh, bandwidth. Uh, just give me a minute, please. Yeah. Uh, I also uh, headed the sustainability or ESG or integrated reporting effort, as he mentioned. And uh, yeah, okay. Now, uh, firstly, a brief idea about uh, capital markets, and I've kept it simple. Uh, uh, the market regulator is SEBI, Securities Exchange Board of India. Uh, the markets can broadly be classified into primary and secondary markets. Primary markets will typically be IPOs and FPOs, uh, as well as uh, FDI is also categorized under primary. But most IR people will be dealing with secondary market investors and that to equity investors. Again, uh, investments can be classified into equity, debt, and uh, converts as well. And of course, you've got other uh, 
uh, forms of investment like PE. Uh, now, uh, the intermediaries that function in this market are primarily brokerage houses, institutional brokerage houses, investment bankers, stock exchanges, banks, and depositories. <clears throat> and other players would be institutional investors, credit rating agencies, corporates, as well as retail investors. Usually, investor relations do not deal with retail investors. Secretarial departments deal with them. Uh, what investor relations usually, the two categories of people that investor relations deal with are brokerage houses and institutional investors, which are called sell side and buy side. The reason why they're called so is that brokerage houses actually sell a story. They bring out research reports, the analysts bring out research reports, which go to thousands of investors across the globe. And uh, institutional investors are called buy side because they buy the story, not because they uh, buy any particular stock as such. So uh, they are loosely called sell side and buy side in, in capital markets parlance. Uh, uh, going to slide number uh, eight, I'll briefly explain what uh, investor relations, uh, what the core of the function is. And this, is a, this will be the flow of my presentation, as you can see. Uh, now coming to uh, the core in investor relations, firstly, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one deals with uh, brokerage houses, uh, usually uh, headed by somebody uh, who's designated as, a, as an equity head. Uh, <clears throat> then you have a head of research, then you've got analysts as well as sales heads. Sales heads normally, most IR people don't interact with them, but I have found that it uh, pays to interact with them uh, if you can touch base with them. them. And, uh, investor relations usually deals very intimately with analysts who cover that particular sector and that particular stock. Uh, then you have domestic institutional investors and they've become a very potent force nowadays. And because the uh, assets under management uh, that they uh, manage are also very significantly large nowadays. Uh, 10 years back, they were, it was not, not always so. And finally, you've got institutional investors spread across multiple geographies. Usually the, the geographies which we invest in India are in Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, uh, continental Europe to some extent, uh, UK and uh, Americas. When I say Americas, it's both, uh, uh, it's both the USA as well as Canada. And of course, you have a few funds in the Middle East and a few funds in Japan. So one needs to engage with the... Now, ultimately, this <clears throat> function is a spokesman function which means that you are the face of the organization that you represent to this, uh, to capital markets represented by three, these three uh, uh, audiences. But in addition to this, there are some very other important functions. Firstly, one has to deal, one has to uh, build bridges internally with all business sets because ultimately, uh, since you're the spokesman, you will be the spokesman. You have to know the business thoroughly, which means periodically touching base with business heads. And particularly if it is a conglomerate, you'll have to deal with multiple business sets. You'll also have to deal with multiple internal departments, whether it be finance accounts, treasury taxation, and business finance, usually business in large conglomerates. Uh, businesses have independent uh, financial statements, so they have their own finance and accounts teams. One has to interact with all of them. Uh, primarily on a quarterly basis to get insights into the financial statements. Then. Uh, IR is also a conduit to top management. One typically needs to interact very, very closely with CFOs, uh, very often with CFOs as well as whole time directors. And usually uh, investor relations also uh, periodically briefs a board committee, which is a stakeholder and relationship committee, which is usually, comp which usually, usually comprises of external uh, uh, directors, uh, non-executive. And finally, the last piece in this is a huge amount of external info, in, information sources which one needs to tap on economy, industry, sectors, as well as various analyst uh, reports. So this is by and large the uh, core, these, these are by and large the core functions. And as I mentioned, the most important part obviously are the first uh, right hand three functions. Uh, now, uh, these, I would also call them circles of influence because ultimately, you are in, uh, interacting with these uh, broad categories of people. Uh, now, prerequisites of best-in-class IR. There are five broad prerequisites. First and foremost, you will need an expert knowledge of the financial statements as well as underlying financial health. 
somebody may ask you uh, uh, where do you think your return on equity will be over the next uh, five years and hopefully you have been, been been able to build a model around that uh, so fan- expert knowledge of financial statements is a all important uh, non negotiable requirement the other non negotiable requirement is a deep understanding of the organization's business and processes for example when i was in lnt i used to face questions on all sector somebody used to ask me what will be the total spends in uh, uh, metro rail projects across uh, uh, across india over the next 5 years and typically uh, how much uh, uh, does an underground metro railway cost and how much does an elevated metro rail cost uh, in terms of uh, rupees crores per kilometer so one has to be on top of all these uh, uh, data points as well as understand the business in detail somebody may ask me uh, uh, where do you think nuclear power is headed and what sort of spends in billions of dollars will happen over the next few years so that's what i mean by understanding of organizations businesses and processes this is one function within normally the function reports to the cfo and this is one function within the finance and accounts uh, fraternity which deals very very closely with the uh, business uh, one needs to also have an in depth knowledge of the sectors that the organization operates in uh, because uh, invariably you will be asked questions on the sector and so it also one also is valued for a sound understanding of the macro economic environment for example i remember in 2013 one common question that i used to get was how do, how is india dealing with its twin deficit at that point of time we used to have a large fiscal deficit as well as a large current account deficit so one needs to come to grips with uh, this as well and of course if one is good then one is valued for this for example in the last couple of years last one year actually i i also used to make a presentation on the union budget to our executive committee comprising of all the whole time directors uh, uh, which is a testimonial in a way but uh, finally one needs to have su- needs to have superlative communication as well as interpersonal skills uh, for example uh, uh, when i say uh, communication one is the face of the company and uh, interpersonal skills because you will be interacting with so many investors in your uh, in your uh in the role as an ir head at some point of time so typically i used to i had got to know most institutional investors whether it be uh, the chief investment officers or fund managers or even analysts by name and most of them i could just pick up a phone and talk to them so these are typically the prerequisites of best in class investor relations now coming to best in class uh, uh investor uh, what makes a best in class investor relations i'll briefly try to explain this over the next few slides uh, now the one of the most important events in the ir uh, ir calendar is a, is a quarterly earnings call when the company declares its uh, uh, its quarterly results now uh, it's not that uh, uh, one needs to prepare for the, for this for example before every earnings call you need to strategize what your market uh, articulation will be if it's a good quarter uh, accordingly if it's not a good quarter you need to be prepared for what sort of articulation you'll have to uh, you'll make with the market so that the script doesn't exhibit undue volatility finally you will also have to make superlative investor presentations and uh, uh, when i say uh, uh, when i talk about communication it's uh, it covers things like presentation delivery as well as aesthetics and uh, this is one one important uh, important uh, highlight of uh, quarterly earnings call uh, uh, then the management of earnings call is also hugely important particularly if it is a difficult quarter and believe me uh, markets are very unforgiving and uh, they are ruthless uh, they'll point out they'll ask uh, very awkward questions uh, if uh, they are not satisfied with uh, what uh, you have disclosed so management of earnings call is uh, earnings call is another it's an art and a science as well as far as lnt is concerned uh, we are one of the few companies where i used to do the earnings calls independently most companies have their ceos or cfos or a combination of both they are doing the earnings call but at some point of time if you are valued within the organization you will be able to do this independently uh, then after the earnings calls are over typically all brokerage houses an lnt was a uh, uh, was a script covered by a huge number of brokers typically around 50 brokers used to cover us of which i used to interact with around 40 to 
and after the earnings call typically the brokerage houses would be, will bring out detailed reports and one needs to uh, analyze those and make summaries and uh, and get a view on how markets have viewed uh, the results and of course it will be reflected in your stock price the very next day and finally there are other uh, miscellaneous activities which are uh, required and uh, like uh, one has to do the transcription and uh, one ideally should also do peer analysis so this is uh, what earnings call is all about now coming to some housekeeping uh, activities which are very important ideally one needs to since this is also this function is also a funnel to top management and typically when i say top management i mean all time directors uh, and uh, ceo and cfo essentially one ideally should have an information system uh, daily or a bi daily uh, system which captures things like stock price updates ps stock prices indices as well as important information and uh, this typically gives top management a view uh, on where markets are uh, secondly weekly one should also have a weekly mis constituting major buyers and sellers as well as shareholding anal shareholding analysis because stock management usually would like to know who are the major investors who have either sold or bought who are, or who are steady and which are the major ones uh, quarterly of course one could uh, do company stock price trends peer price trends as well as a whole bunch of quarterly info there's no end to this actually and finally on an annual basis one needs to have periodic economic updates comparative benchmarking comparative benchmarking is an art and science on its own and uh, for that one needs to understand the business models of competitors uh, <clears throat> news flows on industries and peers uh, here again uh, this is a vast ocean now these are the housekeeping activities that are typically required uh, coming to just a moment yeah now uh, uh, firstly uh, well, engagement with buy side and sell side you recollect that institutional brokerage houses are typically called sell side and institutional investors are called buy side the first thing that one needs to do before uh, uh, starting engagement with them is to build an investment case and usually this is done jointly with the cfo and at times the ca ceo also steps in uh, uh, one also ideally one should also do investor targeting and there are various classes of investors one is long only investors or uh, you got various uh, acronyms like garp garp stands for uh, growth at a reasonable price if your stock price is uh, if you think it is uh, undervalued ideally you should target value investors but uh, one also needs to target the investor audience that uh, you would like to engage with and but at times it's also not in your hands for example you in a large uh, corporate you will keep on getting requests for meetings and ideally you need to cover uh, uh, the entire uh, gamut of all investors of course what i used to do is in meetings which used to come through brokerage houses where i used to analyze those carefully and in case of very small funds uh, i used to tell brokerage houses why don't you uh, educate the investors and if on top of that they want a meeting then i'm fine uh, one also uh, the typical modes of in engagement with investors are number one investor conferences uh, then you've got non deal road shows there are, these are two bro these are the two two uh, major uh, uh, modes of meeting them conferences are usually arranged by brokers but to some extent it's also a logistical pairing exercise where uh, where uh, broker circulate names of corporates will be attending conferences and investors express their in interest in meeting corporates so the brokers would fix the uh, schedule as such non deal road shows are bespoke uh, meetings in the sense that typically uh, uh, every uh, twice a year the cfo and i used to go on uh, international road shows to hong kong singapore uk uh, us and canada and uh, we used to tell the uh, we used to choose brokerages to fix up meetings and we used to tell the investors which meetings that uh, that we would like to attend and non deal road shows means uh, you are just meeting them for uh, to explain your uh, financials and business casing and not for any other purpose like meet like raising funds raising funds would be a deal road show now in case of non deal road shows typically you will go to the investor offices uh, the advantage is that you can meet the entire team in one place in a conference you'll meet only one person at a time so you'll probably meet the 
uh, CIO, uh, chief investment officer, as well as all the fund managers and the analysts. So you go to a investor's office, typically uh, internationally, a one hour meeting is a standard uh, timeline. So you will spend one hour, then you will go to the next uh, investor's office. So you'll have to build in travel time. But uh, I personally feel that that is more fruitful. Then again, one uh, has a number of one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, these are usually based on requests. One can also organize investor days where you get management to talk to investors throughout the day or maybe half a day. And that is, that is something which investors love. Then you can also take them on plant or facilities visits. So these are the various modes by which one can engage with investors. Uh, engagement with sell side typically tends to be very deep because analysts will cover your, your company. They'll be covering your sectors. For example, all the cap capital goods analysts used to cover L&T and uh, they will arrive at their own conclusion and they will uh, do the valuation. Usually the valuation in case of a complex company takes the form of an SOTP or some of the parts valuation where each business is valued separately. And then they'll come out with <coughs> what they think is a fair target price. Now for large companies, it's fine. But for small companies, typically they struggle to get coverage by good brokerage houses. And that's where you can play a very important role in expanding coverage. Uh, then there are a whole lot of other issues uh, like issue management. I remember a few years back, uh, the World Bank had uh, banned l &T from bidding for its projects for six months uh, due to some very stupid reason. And, and uh, there was a bit of a crisis because uh, markets were uh, uh, kept on asking us what had happened. So one needs to be prepared for handling issues. One needs to have a higher messaging norm. And of course, there are other things like uh, giving monthly investor relations reports to top management, and of course, maintaining a detailed database. So these are this is what goes into engagement with markets as well as other small uh, uh, hygiene uh, issues. Uh, <clears throat> now, what makes a best-in-class IR? A best-in-class IR typically, firstly, one has to have quarterly uploads, uh, not just the investor presentation, and but. Uh, in fact, LNT was one of the few companies where uh, we used to upload the Excel files uh, along with the investor presentation uh, before the earnings calls because uh, this arose, uh, uh, we started this around six years back because uh, feedback used to indicate that markets found it very difficult to uh, put everything from a PDF to an Excel file and analyze it. So we used to make their uh, job easier. Uh, of course, uh, results were uploaded in PDF format. And so this is a very basic uh, requirement. Secondly, one needs to have a structured process for earnings calls and compliance with prevention of insider trading. For example, uh, one uh, practice which some companies do, which I don't strictly ag agree with, is that they send an invitation to investors, but to, to uh, that can be construed as selective invitation. Now, what uh, what we had did, uh, and what I had done, in fact, around 10 years back in LNT is that uh, uh, I started a process whereby we put up a notice on our website and there's a public notice and uh, we open a registration window between three to five days before the actual call. So anybody who's interested, interested including retail investors, can uh, register on, the, on our website to participate in the call. Now, that is a completely non-discriminatory process which uh, investors also value. So this, uh, according to me, is a very important part of... Uh, uh, best in class uh, IR. Then finally, one needs to have a proper website with uh, proper contents, transcripts, audio, video repairs, and uh, one needs to set in uh, set up communication norms, including something called UTSI. This is a term coined by SEBI uh, to, that indicates unpublished price sensitive information. Essentially, what it says is that if you uh, if you or anybody in the company is in possession of information which could which could influence stock prices. Stock exchanges first have to be informed before before markets or before the press. So one, this is becoming more and more important. So compliance with UPS and norms of SEBI are also extremely important. Uh, and one needs to have a proper system for this. Then uh, one common uh, thing that I, uh, uh, question which I used to uh, uh, face from investors was that uh, our governance was typically all over the place. Some parts were in, uh, in the board report, some parts were in the annual business responsibility report, some parts were in the management discussion and analysis of the annual report, 
some certifications and related to RPT matters used to be tucked away in the financial statement. Some parts of governance were in the integrated report and some were on our websites. So last time what uh, we did or rather what I did is that over a few days I sat down and I drafted a comprehensive document on, on governance which we included in the uh, integrated report. So you have governance in, in one place. I'll explain what governance is a bit later. And finally, best in class hire also means that you need to climb the sustainability ladder. And this is where the importance of ESG comes in. I've got a couple of slides on that, so I'll uh, explain that. Now, essentially, these are the broad uh, building blocks of what I call best in class investor relations. Finally, what is happening today, and, put, and this is more so over the last one year or last two years, and more so over the last one year is that investigations and ESG is converging. Now, uh, I won't get into ESG because that's a different topic by itself. Uh, of course, I, I uh, was part of the Apex uh, Sustainability Task Force in LNT since 2008. So I've been, uh, when we brought out, our, brought out our first sustainability report, and for the last three years, when we graduated to uh, from sustainability reporting to integrated reporting, uh, which adds various overlays, I'll explain that, uh, uh, overlays to sustainability. Uh, I uh, headed the Apex Task Force. So I was responsible for bringing out the integrated report for LNT. And uh, incidentally, in 2020, we won the Grant Thornton Award for Best Integrated Report in India. Uh, uh, now, what is uh, ESG? Essentially, uh, uh, it's a uh, so, uh, awakening of social cons conscience and activism, uh, an advent of what is called uh, uh, PPP or <coughs> People Planet Profit, or uh, which is also known as Triple Bottom Line Reporting, started gaining pace in the mid 90s, even though a number of uh, events like the Minamata tragedy in Japan or the thalidomide poisoning in Germany in the mid 60s uh, started uh, this uh, uh, awareness. Essentially, what ESG is about is that we, the outside world thinks that corporate should not exist only for profit. They must also look into how they impact society and the environment in addition to profit. So that's why it's called triple bottom line reporting. And most companies are embracing that. Now, environment obviously focuses on areas like uh, carbon footprint, footprinting, material sourcing, emissions, whether they're uh, 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 type one, type two, or type, uh, type three emissions. Most companies won't uh, report type three emissions, but anyway, one needs to typically start getting into this as well because you will face questions on things like this. Uh, there's a whole laundry list of other uh, points as well. I've not included them. And uh, the, this, the, the E is in ESG stands for environment. The S stands for social. And it focuses on areas, areas like employee welfare and occupational health and safety and talent attraction, working conditions, labor management practices, CSR activities, and nowadays things like diversity, inclusion, gender balance. In fact, I'll give you, a, uh, I'll give you a, uh, an example. Sometime in August last year, there were reports that a very large uh, Scandinavian fund was, exi was exiting from uh, an Indian corporate, their, in from a, their investments in an Indian corporate because uh, they, Apparently, uh, some third party reported that that corporate was employing child labor at their factory in Bangalore. And believe me, when word got out, it happened in early August and it uh, uh, the stock price of that particular company fell by 13% in a span of 10 days. And obviously, there's a huge market cap erosion. Of course, that company did well to clarify its position and they, they denied it, of course. And over a period of time, they again came back to the earlier levels. But that is a way in which the outside world looks at these issues. Finally, I, I mentioned governance. Now, governance focuses on the entire uh, gamut of what the architecture is, what the board is, uh, composition is like, uh, what the board diversity is like, what the board committees are like, what executive management uh, comprises of, and going right down to the different structure, because ultimately the structure of the organization to some extent determines the uh, extent of governance. Uh, People also look at board evaluation and familiarization programs. Then you've got whistleblower in investigation committees. Then WASH became mandatory. WASH is prevention of sexual harassment in the workplace. It became mandatory in the Companies Act 2014. Then uh, people look at whether you've got code of conducts uh, both within the company and for the vendors. Then they look at internal controls and risk management frameworks and 
prevention of insider trading and related party transactions. One can go on and on, but if any of you are interested, if you go to the LNT site and you download the integrated report for 2020, you will find a detailed document uh, giving the entire governance structure and the processes there, in case any, any of you are interested. But the reason I'm saying this is that as IR, you will also have, uh, have to uh, deal with investors who ask about this. Now, uh, I'd just like to give one more slide on uh, this. Uh, firstly, there's an increased focus, particularly in the last one or two years of investors on ESG within uh, corporates. So they will keep on asking you as an IR head. Uh, the awareness of ESG is spreading and uh, this picture shows how people earlier used to try to dangle carrots and investors uh, follow, but investors awareness of ESG is spreading rapidly. Uh, Nowadays, many investors ask very detailed questions. In fact, I remember sometime in early 2020, I took a call from a Singapore-based uh, large uh, fund house. And uh, one hour was, uh, that call was only on governance. In fact, it was supposed to be one hour, but it extended to one hour, 20 minutes. So, and that is the sort of importance that investors are placing on uh, ESG. They're also asking a lot of main, uh, non-mainstream areas, like what is your diversity hiring checklist? What are you doing to correct gender balance in the company? Uh, there's an increasing compliance burden. In fact, uh, a large part of sustainability is covered and under what is called the annual business responsibility report, which is part of the board report. Uh, but uh, SEBI and uh, Department of Company Affairs have brought out a draft of something called a annual business and sustainability report. And uh, that's a, a huge compliance burden. Uh, of course, we've all given our feedback to then, but ultimately, we'll have to see what form it comes out in. And my sense is that in the next one year, it will become a ABRR, will become ABSR. It will be, become mandatory. Uh, governance is a prime focus, and you cannot whitewash things uh, as you could even five years back. People are uh, uh, looking at it with a very hard focus, and this picture sort of explains it. In the middle picture, you can see that somebody is shot an arrow, and he's trying to paint a bullseye around that arrow. People uh, will not get taken in uh, by these practices nowadays. So it's a huge focus. And finally, a lot of funds are getting deallocated. Today, you've got ESG funds. In fact, uh, if you go to BlackRock, which is the largest investment house in the world, and uh, I think they manage something like uh, six or seven trillion dollars of uh, investments. And uh, Larry Fink, which is a CEO, typically sends out a report, a letter every year to CEOs. And this year's letter is only on uh, ESG. Uh, that is the importance which all fund houses are, uh, are giving to ESG. And finally, it has reached, it's not reaching, actually, it's, it has reached clamor status. So this one part where you need to get involved. Uh, some other value added uh, add, uh, that one can do. Uh, uh, firstly, the first value add is uh, if a company is going in for an IPO or a uh, follow-on public offer, one can add value through investor targeting. In fact, I remember when in LNT, when we listed LNT Infotech and uh, prior to that, LNT Financial Services and then Infotech and LNT Technology Services. In fact, for when we listed LNT Technology Services, I accompanied the CEO and their CFO uh, uh, all across the world, uh, starting from San, San Francisco, then Utah, then Boston, New York, Abu Dhabi, London, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore. We did 72 meetings in 12 days. Uh, Primarily, I accompanied them because I knew all the investors. So even though I was more of a uh, fly on the wall, I used to typically go and say, hey, Prashant, I'm here just to introduce uh, Mr. So-and-so, and, -so, and uh, I'll be more of an observer. In I, I'm accompanying them since I know you. Uh, so typically, and I landed up vetting all the, uh, all the investor, targeted investors uh, that investment bankers typically come up with. Then finally, one can add value to the chairman or CEO's message in the annual report because as IR, you would have a 360 de degree view of business, which is all important. And in large companies, very few people do this. In fact, for the last uh, 11 years, I, I've been drafting the uh, chairman statement for, for LNT. Of course, it, uh, uh, corporate communication typically would polish it. And then I'd have to run the gauntlet uh, with the chairman, Mr. Mack, who is to go through it word by word and ask all sorts of questions and he used to give his own inputs and he used to change. And uh, 
modify the statement, but ultimately one can play a very important role. Particularly, one can also add value to contents of the board report. And this is where your relationship building with your secretary department uh, will uh, uh, come into play. Then one can contribute in management discussion and analysis as well as financial information. For example, uh, the CFO, uh, ultimately I used to give the sign off to the CFO MDNA before, uh, uh, before publishing it in the annual report. Then of course, investor relations plays a hugely important role in the conduct of AGM. In fact, I know uh, large companies as one company where, uh, uh, where the CEO actually uh, uh, thanked the IR head at the AGM uh, upfront for, for facilitating the AGM itself. Then one can also uh, do perception studies. Of course, I would not recommend more than once in a year, even though there are firms which specialize in this like Thomson Reuters or IPO, one can either engage that them or one can decide to do your own perception study. After all, you will have all the uh, major investors through secretary department. Typically, secretary department will get a report which is called a BenPost report, which stands for beneficial positions. And uh, that's on a weekly basis. So you will have a uh, insight into who are your main investors. And if required, you can do a perception study amongst them. Uh, then, as I mentioned, one can contribute to ESG and uh, because you'll have to work very closely with the ESG teams in your uh, companies. And this, I cannot but uh, overemphasize on this particular aspect because it has become so important nowadays. Uh, one area where uh, IR can add value is engagement with ESG advisory, advisory bodies like MSCI. MSCI is Morgan Stanley Composite Index. Uh, they have their own ESG. There's another firm called Sustainalytics, which is uh, which does ESG. Uh, these are advisory bodies. They bring out their own reports on corporates, and these reports go out to thousands of investors all, all over the world. So one can set up lines of communication with them to ensure that you are uh, appropriately represented in their reports. Uh, now, one slide, putting it all together. See, firstly, markets usually assign a stock premium to best-in-class IR. Uh, a good IR tends to mitigate script volatility because one needs to condition markets on, on good or bad without uh, specifically telling them in, in advance. It usually ensures fair business valuations. Uh, it's a rich funnel of information for top management, uh, information on markets. It's a framework, it provides a framework for issue management in terms of, in times of crisis. Uh, it provides a guidepost for compliance with prevention of insider trading norms which are typically brought out by SEBI. Uh, a good IR can certainly expand research coverage as well as market reach. And it also facilitates capital raising. And finally, uh, strong ESG focus significantly enhance, enhances the investor universe and paves a way for valuation bump up. In fact, every single fund house in Europe follows ESG norms. They'll not invest in a company unless they're convinced that the company follows good ESG. <coughs> Now coming to career prospects in IR, uh, uh, you will be part of the finance and accounts fraternity, typically reporting to the CFO. And uh, as this diagram shows, you'll have to interact with all uh, uh, corporate level departments. And of course, there's also something here, I put business F&A, which, uh, which would be finance and accounts, which is embedded in business, uh, 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 in different businesses. Because in large conglomerates, uh, business typically have their own balance sheet, p &L cash flows. In fact, I used to head corporate accounts, so we used to consolidate uh, 160 legal entities every quarter. Uh, uh, these are to some extent ballpark numbers, but uh, current compensation levels, entry level would typically start off at around 10, 12 lakhs or so. After five years, one can move into a 15, 20 lakh bracket. After 10 years, with anything between 25 to 35 lakh. 15 years, typically you will be a seasoned uh, professional drawing minimum uh, 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 around 40 to 50 lakhs or, or above. 20 years plus could be anything. Could be, could be, uh, definitely become one crore or thereabouts, whatever. I'm not uh, putting any number, but it could be anything, including uh, uh, stock options. But mind you, this, it was, as I mentioned here again, my disclaimer is, is that it's a bit of a gut feel based upon my experience. And it varies widely from organization to organization. Finally, one question which uh, I typically ask people is that companies usually have two type of, types of structures. One would be a very tall structure and one would be a flat structure. 
Now it is up to you to decide which one you prefer. For example, in a tall structure, one can at least expect promotions every two to three years. And, but again, it's a long climb up the ladder. Whereas in a flat uh, organization structure, the levels are much lower and one has to wait for very long times before one gets a promotion. But at the same time, a few promotions and you uh, reach the top. So ultimately, it's a choice which you will have to make with uh, what sort of organization you'll join. Uh, advantages that you have is that uh, you have the ability to analyze financial statements. You have, you've got a strong understanding of valuations. For example, nobody needs to uh, teach you how to, what is the significance of WAC minus G in the calculation of terminal value. Uh, you can do a lot of financial modeling. For example, I used to do the entire return on equity modeling for the group as a whole. You understand markets, economy, understanding of business and business models. And this is one of the few outward facing finance and accounts function. Treasury is another, but this function is more outward facing. Uh, one, uh, Investor Relations has ready years of top management and it has a very high visibility as well. And of course, one can readily move to other functions such as treasury, business finance, mergers and acquisitions, corporate strategy. One can move to CFO office or CEO's office. One can move to other corporates as well. And one can also move to sell side or buy side. However, you cannot leave it too late because uh, uh, people will see your past experience. In fact, I know somebody who's done that. And finally, you require a lot of so soft skills like interpersonal skills, networking ability. And uh, I will not read out every word on this. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Raj for uh, uh, the Q&A session. Many thanks, Arnav, for this uh, very um, delightful and excellent presentation. You made a very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation on the career prospects for uh, investor relations. Uh, while investor relations um, actually serves as a very uh, critical function, um, largely as an interface between uh, investors and the company, very little actually is uh, known. And I think uh, with your presentation, you kind of demystified some of the aspects of, uh, you know, and the prospects in uh, investor relations. Thank you for that. Um, as a reminder to the audience, um, uh, while there have been some questions that have um, come through already, you can submit questions uh, through the uh, box that is available through the Q&A link at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we, and now I proceed to Anub again. Um, uh, for some very interesting questions that we have already received. Uh, Anub, um, I think one of the um, uh, questions that we have received, more, uh, in fact, uh, from more than uh, one, is about, uh, you know, what are the entry level uh, prospects for investor relations? What are the qualifications or the experience levels that you look at? Of course, you covered the, uh, you know, the, the softer aspects as well as, uh, you know, the advantage that a, a CFA has over maybe other qualifications. But how does one get in at an entry level? Uh, is a you know a MBA required? Uh, you know many of the entry uh, you know typically CFA charter holders are not typically entry level um, uh, you know job prospectors. So uh, what do you think uh, about this question? And uh... I will give you an example. In RNT, uh, uh, I had recruited somebody who was a CFA and a CA as well. At, uh, not at an entry level, but at a mid-management level. Uh, he's, he's still a good friend of mine, incidentally. He stayed with us for a few years and then uh, uh, he moved to uh, the buy side, incidentally. So uh, if you're a CFA, definitely you will understand, people will understand that you understand financials. And uh, that is a big plus because uh, CFAs typically have a very good view of things like balance sheet, p &L, cash flows, financial modeling. And usually investor relations officers either come from an engineering background or a finance background. So uh, if one is a, if one is a, if one has experience, one can get in at typically at a mid management level, or uh, if one doesn't have experience, one can typically get in at a starting level. Of course, you'll have to work your way through any organization. That's a, a part of life in any organization. Yeah, the one offshoot of this question, thanks uh, Anna, for this uh, and clarifying, um, uh, I think um, is in terms of, are there any special qualifications that are there for investor relations per se? Um, you know, uh, typically I think uh, largely, um, you know, you have covered that uh, it requires certain degree of secret secretarial level knowledge, financial knowledge, communication knowledge. Are these all brought together somewhere as a certification uh, the, uh, uh, 
is there any kind of um, certification available for that and also i think if you could cover in terms of whether an mba i mean um, uh, can also uh, who's of course interested in finance and uh, maybe you know appearing but still not a charter holder in cfa can uh, be uh, recruited for this kind of a position absolutely in fact most corporates uh, prefer either charter accountants or cfas or mba finances typically because uh, while uh, these three categories of people can pick up the under can start can pick up the uh, basics of business uh, engineers find it a bit more difficult to get into details of balance sheet pnl cash flows accounting treatment and uh, uh, the legal framework as well so typically ir uh, investor relations uh, prefers either cas or uh, cfas or mba finances typically but there are no exceptions but normally but there's no specialized uh, qualification or no, research no there's no specialized qualification for this and uh, the scope is increasing because out of uh, i think there are around 7 to 7 and 1000 listed uh, uh, stocks in india uh, you maybe have around uh, 200 to 250 companies which have ir so a large part of it uh, is uh, as i mentioned uh, people double hat as far as ir and other functions are concerned so you mentioned about of course double hatting here i mean uh, typically in a smaller company relatively uh, unlike lnt which is a large conglomerate uh, might uh, require a specialized uh, ir function so what are the functions they are clubbed under i mean is it largely a cfo's um, ambit or uh, where exactly the, does these uh, you know this function uh, uh, gets clubbed see uh, typically this function would get uh, the cfo would double hat to some extent but it's not possible for the cfo to do uh, Uh, maybe 100 meetings in a year or so so typically he would have an uh, ir uh, person with additional uh, responsibility as well who would be authorized to talk to markets so it would be a cfo plus a senior finance person under the cfo who would uh, do this function uh, thanks you mentioned uh, you know this is typically a case of insourcing of uh, ir function but there is one question that's come from um, uh, our attendee today is can investor relation be outsourced yes it certainly can in fact uh, uh, i have opened my own ir consultancy firm of course i uh, there's a bit of a setback because i contacted a bad case of covid so everything got pushed back even while i was talking to some prospective customers so i have my own i have opened my own investor relations consultancy so it can be outsourced and uh, smaller companies very often prefer to outsource it uh, instead of engaging full time resources and that's why uh, you got uh, uh, so many companies which don't have full time ir so many companies follow a hybrid model where the cfo and uh, a senior finance professional handles ir but they also rely on an outsourced uh, agency to guide them on uh, what is important and to do a lot of the leg work so yes it certainly can be outsourced so who are these agencies who do it i mean are there specialized ir agencies or are typically the reputation management and pr agencies uh, double up as uh, investor relations uh, agency as well see pr agencies are not have not in traditionally not been so uh, successful because uh, one needs to have an understanding of uh, a deep understanding of balance sheet uh, pnl cash flows a financial uh, understanding as well uh, there are a few i don't really like to take names but there are a few ir firms in fact what is happening is that all the uh, big firms like whether it be kpmg or ernst and young they've also got into this now in fact uh, i've been getting some feelers from some of the big four whether they'd like to in, uh, do something jointly with them instead of doing it alone so uh, so all the big firms are also looking at this as an important thing but uh, uh, the advantage uh, Uh, which an ir person has is that he has actually faced markets typically an outsource agency will not face markets yeah and i think there are some questions related to communication here external communications and especially when a company is going through a crisis or a stress situation and uh, or you know having um, you know uh, uh, to handle situations like uh, you know having investments in companies like uh, you know companies that might have faced stress or uh, defaulting etc so in that case uh, you know how does the um, um, uh, investor relations uh, officer when meeting uh, the analysts give they give them comfort or what's the kind of communication that uh, um, uh, he or she does in such cases 
That's a bit of a difficult question and one, uh, it would vary from case to case actually. Uh, I, I, I briefly mentioned that in NNT a few years back, around five or six years back, a crisis erupted and I started getting calls. In fact, uh, the large uh, the large broker house advised the CFO to host a conference call. The CFO asked me, I said, I don't cater to that. You just give me a few hours. So what I did in such a situation was that fortunately I had built bridges with the equity sales heads of uh, brokerage houses. And those are the people who actually interact with uh, investors. So I tapped a few of them and I told them that uh, I would like to express my point of view through you because you know the investors. And this is what I have to say. It would be very good if you could endorse my point of view through a blast email, which you can send out immediately. And their emails go to thousands of investors across the globe. And I contacted uh, uh, five of them, of which three of them, uh, two just reported what I had to say, and three of them actually endorsed my view. So ultimately, we didn't have to do any call or whatever. But uh, it's a one will have to play it by the year. Typically, when a crisis erupts, uh, I typically either uh, directly ring up the CFO or the CEO directly. And uh, typically, as an IR head, you will have their mobile numbers. So either you ring them up or you send them a message saying that this crisis has erupted. Request your guidance on, on how to deal with this. If you feel, uh, because ultimately you're the spokesman and, and uh, media will catch hold of it uh, at some point of time. So they will also have to face questions from media. So uh, in times of need, I used to fall back on CEO on the, and very often the CFO or CEO used to say, okay, let's have a quick uh, five minute call. So we used to have a tripartite call and decide what are uh, articulation to markets and the media would be. I was not authorized to talk to media but typically, we used to be on the same platform. Right. Thanks. And, uh, you know, here's an interesting article, uh, you know, question from, um, again, um, one of the audience here uh, is in terms of, you know, the COVID times and how it's changed the workflow across um, several companies. So how uh, did um, this COVID impact, uh, you know, um, uh, meeting investors? Of course, uh, video conferencing technology was always available. So what has changed? Uh, basically on the workflow and the virtual meetings now um, than uh, pre-COVID? See, uh, earlier we used to have one earnings call every quarter and in LNT around uh, between 150 to 200 people used to log in and we used to always hold it outside uh, market hours. Obviously, we didn't want any script volatility. Uh, after COVID, what we found is that, of course, the first uh, quarter, the CEO uh, himself along with the CFO and me, three of us took the took the call, and we found that uh, the attendance jumped from around 150 normally. It jumped to 300, and thereafter we find that it is uh, every quarter people close to 300 people have been logging onto calls. But everything is, became virtual post COVID. Uh, I suspect that yes, it'll uh, once uh, the world finds a solution to this uh, virus, uh, some amount of physical meetings will again start. But at the same time, a large part will be virtual. But mind you, there's no substitute for meeting people face to face. In fact, I, the reason why I knew investors all across the globe and I knew them on first term basis, first name basis was that I was meeting them every year, at least twice a year in a physical meeting. And uh, uh, virtual meetings lead to very different uh, behavioral traits and social characteristics. So I suspect that it will gradually move to a hybrid uh, model major part of which will be virtual and some part of which will be physical. But today everything is virtual. So, yeah, I, I, yeah. so you, I mean, the face, to, there's no substitute for face to face. I think that's the bottom line there. And, um, you know, there's one uh, interesting question here is how do you distribute your time among buy side and sell side? Is there a kind of a fixed formula or how do you kind of uh, devote time and or do you actually distinguish between buy side and sell side or are you typically agnostic to it? No, but uh, <clears throat> typically uh, uh, sell side, which are the brokers, do uh, get much more uh, deeper into details. So with sell side, you have to be thoroughly prepared. In fact, uh, I typically used to prepare for around uh, three to five days uh, before every quarter's results. And I used to have a thick bunch of uh, my own workings uh, with every fact and uh, number at hand because sell side people we will get deep into that buy side people ask questions more on business yes they do ask questions on financial and there's no allocation that one can do except for the fact that out of the three to four hundred meetings that i used to do every year 
around uh, 50 of them used to be with the cell side and the remaining with buy side. So the buy side meetings are typically be much more voluminous in number, much more voluminous. Because the number of players are more or? Uh... Number of players are much more, much more. So there's one more thing is how uh, exhaustive is the work um, uh, load on IR? Uh, is there kind of a work-life balance or do you find, find that the uh, job is largely imbalanced? Uh, very difficult question to answer. In fact, when I started, like all of us, when we started working from home, I found that my working hours had become hugely elongated and uh, uh, I used to take calls at any time of the day or almost any time of the night. So, but... Uh, Workload, uh, if you're only into IR, typically uh, uh, what happens is that uh, you will have a decent work-life balance with one caveat. You have to be a voracious reader. So most of your free time will go into uh, studying something like sectors or macroeconomy. So, uh, and I used to do that at home very often. Work used to be for meetings. Uh, well, whether it be meetings with markets or meetings with business people, because one has to keep on, that's a hugely important thing, uh, uh, building bridges with business heads. And one of the best way to be, ways to do that, which I found is that I used to take business heads with me to conferences. So they used to get a complete 360 degree view and they used to carry those learnings back home to their own uh, uh, jurisdictions. So, I mean, uh, the key is that it's not a nine to five job. And, uh, no, the it's not a nine to five job. In fact, nowadays, I don't think you have any nine to five job. And uh, do, I mean, the other thing is what specific mandate does the IR operate in? I mean, is there some kind of um, uh, a situation where you are uh, told to give information up to a point and beyond that uh, escalate? Is there an escalation matrix that uh, operates here or a hierarchy that operates here or? Uh, I know the uh, investor relations officers are completely empowered to uh, give whatever communication uh, on behalf of the company. Usually IR heads or uh, SEBI has a requirement of what is called a CIRO, a chief investor relations officer, which the board has to actually approve. Now, uh, IROs or CIROs typically have a mandate to uh, articulate as they feel uh, uh, necessary, but uh, beyond a point, there's a limit to the extent of information that one can give. So I used to very clearly say that I'm sorry, but I'll have to disappoint you uh, on this front. I'll not be able to uh, give you that information. After all, I cannot practice selective dissemination of information to uh, markets, and this will fall under that. You know, I think we would be shortly running out of time, but we have three questions that uh, I've allocated now. One is uh, slightly different. In fact, uh, a very interesting question is, uh, uh, all the points mentioned in the presentation applies largely for fundamental investors. Now that quants and algos are such a big um, norm in uh, the investment field, does the IR team target the quantitative strategy firms or uh, this, uh, you know, it's not started yet? You cannot uh, do that. In fact, uh, I remember, for example, uh, you have a whole bunch of passive investors, investors whether they be uh, ETFs or uh, pure passive, and typically they'll not meet you. They, because they follow their own models or whether it be algo trading or, for example, Vanguard used to have a fairly large investment in l &T, But Vanguard uh, typically never meets people. They are passive investors. Uh, they're one of the lowest cost, of, obviously. So, uh, yes, you will, have, uh, you will have situations where money is moving into passive uh, investment forms. But this, at the same time, I do not see active investments, uh, active investments uh, uh, completely vanishing. So you will continue to have to engage with active investors, actively managed investors. Thanks. This, you know, the penultimate question uh, here is largely there have been a certain uh, ESG related questions and uh, I just want to pick up, uh, uh, you know, one or two here. Um, are there any companies that you feel, I mean, uh, other than LNP who have done very well on ESG? Um, is there some standards that uh, yeah, you know, for ESG metrics, I mean, uh, that you go for? I mean, you can club that as one question uh, if you want to answer that. <clears throat> sure. Uh, <clears throat> actually, there are a whole bunch of metrics. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, starting from GHG emissions, whether it be SOX, NOX, or uh, ozone depleting stuff, or uh, that's as far as environment is concerned. So typically, in any organization, you will have to ensure that you set up information systems to capture data. Because just uh, English will not do. You have to back it up with data. So. 
uh, nowadays all large companies bring out uh, either sustainability reports or integrated reports integrated reporting is one level higher under the aegis of international report, integrated reporting council which is an international body and where uh, typically sustainability deals with the e part and the s part <clears throat> then some part of the g governance integrated report has esg it also incorporates business uh, strategy business models and value creation amongst uh, six capitals which you have to report in and all these you have to get externally assured through agencies for example <clears throat> you've got agencies like bvqi or kpmg or ernst and young who who uh, do assurance and uh, all large companies have good and uh, 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 there are some companies which are very good mahindra is a very uh, uh, strong uh, integrated reporting reliance is a very strong integrated reporting one of the best companies is tata steel they have got very good integrated reporting uh, uh, in fact the cfo of tata steel is on committees of various uh, uh, various high part committees on this so typically or you go to any large company you go to their website you will have a download uh, link where you can download the integrated report or sustainability report now I, i would say actually almost all large companies uh, uh, do this it's a smaller mid cap companies that need to uh, step up their game on this front yeah so we are running out of time but this one very last question is uh, what uh, i would ask uh, on up to answer and um, uh, rest i think uh, we should uh, get back to you over other means of communication but uh, this one question on up that i'm putting to you is uh, you know how would you advise a young professional going through the cfa process to build his or her network in the current climate considering that you know you have 25 years of experience and largely communicating to external stakeholders having built network so what is your advice to a candidate cfa uh, um, in the current environment see cfa uh, cfas or uh, budding cfas typically have their own networks uh, Uh, in fact, when I started this function, at one point of time, I was a CFO of one of the businesses in LNT, the electrical and automation business, which we sold for a very large. We sold it for fourteen thousand crores a, a year ago. Uh, but after uh, that, I moved into investor relations in two thousand and nine, and we didn't have things like WhatsApp then. Nowadays, uh, uh, youngsters are very, uh, they are very very tech savvy. They've got their own information sources, and uh, they build bridges. But uh, Uh, there's no easy answer except for the fact that i mentioned that you need to have good interpersonal and networking skills and that is a uh, <clears throat> one of the best uh, qualities that you can have in fulfilling your uh, discharging ir functions so once you have your own network in place then and once you are designated uh, as a spokesman for uh, or you can be uh, under study some spokesman maybe the ir head you will automatically start engaging with markets automatically and you people will start getting to know you thanks on uh, a really invaluable advice there and uh, and thanks once again for uh, sparing time and sharing your in- insights with us today as a reminder to our listeners uh, please do complete the evaluation survey that has appeared on your screen at the end of the session and um, cfa institute and cfa society india members may claim professional learning credit by logging in their online professional learning tracking tool and please do sign up for upcoming webinars if you have not registered already one is due on 18th march 2021 that cios insights on the insurance sector the speaker is dheeraj agarwal cfa and on 22nd april uh, again um, the five time being 5:30 pm to 6:30 pm ist we have practitioners insights on big data and fund manager evaluation by sabhi asher with this i thank you for participating in today's webinar and uh, uh, thanks to you anub and over to you harshit